This afternoon, I wanted to look at a statement by the wise man Solomon. As he makes a statement in Proverbs 14 and verse 5, A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. And I want us to just consider some things about, in particular, that phrase, a faithful witness. And the first thing, obviously, that we see here is that a faithful witness will not lie. When we look at that aspect, we need to recognize God is a God of truth. Several times throughout the Scriptures... And you see this in particular during the Old Testament, but you see it also some in the New Testament. It identifies God as a God of truth. For example, in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is He. Now, there's so much that's involved in that verse uh, dealing with the very nature of God. Uh, each one almost deserving its own lesson. But the fact that his, He is a God of truth. He's without sin or iniquity. He's just or right. That's the nature of God. But the nature of God includes that of being truth. In the 31st Psalm, in verse 5, Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Here the, your, the word Lord is that Hebrew word Yahweh, or Jehovah. Uh, he is a God of truth. Again, in the 65th, chapter of Isaiah in verse 16 tells us that he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hid from mine eyes. So here Isaiah identifies him two times as the God of truth. There's that emphasis in relationship to the Scriptures. In the New Testament, in John 8 and verse 26, he says, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Now the one who had sent him, this is Christ talking, of course, was the Father, and we see that in other passages. Thus he is identifying that one who sent me, the Father, is true. And Jesus revealed those things, he spoke those things that the Father told him. As a result of God being a God of truth, God cannot lie. Every once in a while we come, someone will ask the question or make the statement, well, God can do anything. I always say, no, He can't. And they are almost like, you're denying God then. No, I'm recognizing His nature. There are some things that God cannot do. Can He sin? If He is, He's no longer God. God cannot sin. Another aspect, God, because of His nature being a God of truth, cannot lie. We see this twice in the New Testament, Titus 1 and verse 2, in hope of eternal life that God that cannot lie, or which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Notice the hope of eternal life is directly connected with the fact that God cannot lie. If it was the case, it's not, but if it was the case that God could lie, 
then there would really be no hope that we have of an eternal life. It might all be a lie. Or if he says, you must do this to inherit eternal life, it might be a lie. And if you did that, in reality, you might spend eternity in hell. Because he was lying to you. There would be no hope of eternal life if God can lie. But God cannot lie, therefore we have hope of eternal life. The same principle is seen in Hebrews 6, verses 17 through verse 20. And it's tied to the same aspect. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of His counsel, Immutability means very simply that it cannot change. Something that cannot change. His counsel cannot change. But he confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now if you look at that in particular, there's the hope that is set before us. That's the hope of eternal life that Titus, uh, that we read in Titus 1 and verse 2. And what's it tied to? The fact that the unchangeableness of God's counsel. And as a result of that, he confirmed it with an oath. One of those, it was impossible for God to lie. Again, if God can lie, then it goes against his nature and he actually is no longer God. But if he can lie, there's no hope that we have. There's no consolation. There's no refuge for us to lay hold on because if he's lying, you cannot be assured of anything. We can have assurance of eternal life based upon the fact that here's what God says and if I am obedient to what God says, then he is going to be truthful and will thus save us. Thus, he is a God of truth. And, in reality, lies are Satan. You have truth being of God, lies of Satan. In John 8 and verse 44, Jesus says to the Pharisees, Ye are of your father the devil. The lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. You lie, then you are of your father the devil. So many times that within our society, people think that, well, it's just a little lie. It's not going to hurt anyone. Not realizing, and Christians have sadly gotten that same idea many times, not realizing that all lies are Satan. When you tell a lie, even if it's a small lie that you think it's not going to hurt anyone, you're Satan. It's as simple as that. That's what Jesus says. Why? Because of the very nature of God and the nature of Satan. Satan is a liar. That's his nature. God is a God of truth. That's His nature. Now, if we have the nature of God, we speak truth. If we lie, we have the nature of Satan, who is the spiritual father of those who lie. Well, thus, as Solomon said there in our text, a false witness speaks lies doesn't speak the truth. But Jesus is a faithful witness. A witness is one who bears testimony of another. Jesus is referred to as a faithful witness. 
In Hebrews 1 and verse 3, Hebrew writer, after setting forth the fact that Jesus is our great high priest, that he is that one who is... Um, well, here he sets forth the fact that of his priesthood and his kingship. And so you have Jesus, the Son of God, being presented as the Christ, priest, prophet, and king. In verses 1 and verse 2, that God has spoken through his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Now, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. There is the aspect of priesthood. Set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. There is kingship. And by the way, where he is priest is the same place where he is king. He cannot be a priest on earth, he, the Hebrew writer talks about in chapters 7, 8, and 9. He had to go into heaven itself. And he is a priest in heaven. Thus his kingship is in heaven. But while upon earth, he was the express image of the very nature of God, the character of God. John in Revelation 1 and verse 5 also says from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead under the, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He's the faithful witness. We could actually say in that aspect of being a faithful witness, he was serving as a, the great prophet of God. You see his kingship with the prince of the kings of the earth, and that literally is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And then his priesthood and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus the Christ. But he is that faithful witness. Thus, when we look at Christ, we are seeing the Father. As Jesus has assembled his apostles and he is speaking to them specifically now, John chapters 14, 15, and 16, Philip asks him the question, show us the Father and it suffices. And Jesus' response, have I been so long time with you and yet you have not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? You look at Jesus, you see Him, you see the express image of the very character of God Himself. The nature of the Father. You see me, you've seen the Father. In Matthew, the 11th chapter, in verse 27, Jesus says that all things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Based upon that then, he gives us that great invitation, verses 28 through verse 30, to come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. No man knows the Father save the Son, and he, the Son, to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. The Son is revealing to us the Father, so that when we see Jesus, we see the Father. In John 1 and verse 18, we're told that no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Again, we can't see God. The very nature of God. No man can see God and live. But we can see that express image of God revealing to us the very character and nature of God when we look at Jesus the Christ. 
And thus, Jesus was a faithful witness. He was true in revealing the very nature of God to us. In John, the fourth chapter, in verse 34, in fact, numerous times in John, and we'll look at but a few, Jesus is setting forth the fact that we see here, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Uh, his meat, his food, that which he intended, that w- his purpose was to do the Father's will. When him doing the Father's will, he is revealing to us the Father's will. He is revealing to us his nature and his character, that one that sent him, and thus to finish his work. That no doubt ha- is looking forward to his crucifixion, his resurrection from the grave and ascension into heaven to serve as our priest and our king. In the very next chapter in John chapter 5 and verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but whatsoever he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise." Here is the Father. We can't see Him, but Jesus did because He is God. And what happens? He's doing those things which He saw the Father do. And thus, by seeing Jesus, we see the very nature of God. Again, He states in verse 30, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will but the will of the Father which has sent me. Thus, he is doing the Father's will, not his own. In John the 8th chapter, in verse 38, or John 6 and verse 38, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So again, we have the same principle. Again, in John 8 and verse 28, Then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, ye shall, then shall ye know that I am He, literally I am, and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And while he makes a specific reference to, I speak these things, and thus his words, yet, Everything that he did was what his father taught him. And thus, what he was doing here upon this earth, what he was saying here upon this earth, were not his own, but the father. And when we see and when we hear him, we're seeing the father. And we're hearing the father. This is again emphasized in John 12, verses 48 through 50. That he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Here we have that specific reference to the aspect of his speaking. That his words did not come from himself. They did not originated, originate with himself, but they were the words of the Father. And thus, when we hear Christ, we're hearing the Father. He is that faithful witness of the Father. But now then, we also realize while Jesus was a faithful witness, we need to be a faithful witness as well. Or we need to be faithful. We're not actually witnesses of Christ. We hear a great deal today in our society by the religious people, and sadly it's been picked up by members of the church, that we are to witness for Christ. Well, you don't do it. You can't do it. You don't meet the qualifications. Only the apostles were witnesses for Christ. In Acts first chapter, after the death of Judas, and now then they've got 120 assembled, and they're setting forth someone to take Judas's place. 
But they say in Acts 1 and verse 22, beginning from the baptism of John until the same day that he was taken up from us, that's Christ in his life, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Now then, this is Peter speaking, and he's setting forth in order to be a witness with us of his resurrection. The us is dealing with the apostles, by the way. Here's the qualifications. In order to be a witness, you must have been with Christ from the beginning of the baptism of John until the time in which Jesus was raised and taken up from them. If you don't meet those qualifications, then you can't be a witness. And only those individuals thus who meet those qualifications can be a witness. Now then, show me the person today who meets those qualifications. Well, you're not going to find one. There's no one that old that's still living. Not going to happen. Thus, who are the witnesses? It's the apostles. No one else. In Acts second chapter, as Peter preaches this great gospel sermon, it starts out by saying it's not only Peter, but he stands up with the eleven. Thus, it is a context while Peter is the main spokesman, he's dealing with the apostles. And it says in verse 32, yep, I missed one. I did miss a passage. In Acts 2 and verse 30, 32, I'll get it out in a minute. He says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are witnesses. The we are the ones who are speaking at that time, which was Peter and the other eleven apostles. Thus, the apostles are those who were the witnesses of Christ. And they were witnesses of the fact that God raised him from the dead. Now show me someone today who actually was there, who saw Jesus being ra be having been raised from the dead. You can't do it because no one today meets those qualifications. And because no one meets those qualifications, no one is a witness today. In Acts 10th chapter, as Peter is speaking to the house of Cornelius, he says, and we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slay, slew and hanged on a tree. Now notice who the witnesses are. We are witnesses of what? They were able to witness of all that Jesus did. Why? Because they were there. They saw it. They were among him. They were with him. They saw his death, how that the Jews slew him and hung him on a tree. But then notice in verse 41, well, it says in verse 40, Him hath, or him God raised up, from the raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people. Thus, not even everyone was at that time was a witness. But he showed him to people under witnesses chosen before of God even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. So here a witness is set forth very clearly as someone who lived with Christ during his life here upon this earth, saw the things which he did while he was here, saw him being crucified. After his resurrection, they ate and drank with him. That's what a witness is. A witness is someone who was there with him at that time. Again, Paul now in Acts 13 and verse 31. 
And he was seen many days, that's Jesus, was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. They were supposed to witness to the people. But who were they? It, were those, it was those individuals who came up with Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem. Those were the ones who were the witnesses, not us. There are other passages. Let me just, I have a couple minutes uh, extra, so I'm going to mention this other passage. A lot of times we hear in John the fifth chapter, and in verse 32, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given unto them that obey him. And we hear brethren at times take this phrase, them that obey him, and apply it to all Christians today. Everyone who is a Christian today that this applies to. Now, the problem is, them that obey him has reference to those witnesses. It has reference to the apostles. And that the Holy Spirit was given to the apostles. While that, the idea that the Holy Spirit was given to us matter of debate and discussion, yes. Yet this verse does not teach that. This is dealing with the miracles that the apostles were able to perform by the power of the Holy Ghost. And they, as witnesses, they, they were given the, apostle, the Holy Spirit to enable them to work those miracles and the purpose of miracles being revelatory, to reveal God's message, and to confirm it as being the truth. And thus, the Holy Spirit was given to them, the obeying ones, the apostles of Jesus Christ. While we cannot be wit a witness, we don't meet the qualifications. Yet, we can be and we must be faithful in representing God in the Scriptures. We have that obligation as Christians to preach the gospel. The Great Commission sets forth that we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And yes, while that was given initially to the apostles and applied specifically to them, yet there is an aspect that they were to teach those who had become a disciple all things that Jesus had commanded them, which he commanded them to go and preach the gospel. Thus, we have that same commission given unto us. Go preach the gospel. But the fact is, we have to do so without alteration, without changing it, without adding to it, without taking away from it. We must be faithful in teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul, in Galatians 1, verses 6 through verse 9, says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that hath called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preach unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. What is it? You preach the gospel... And don't preach another gospel. Don't alter it. Don't change it. Don't pervert the gospel of Christ. Yes, preach the gospel, but preach it faithfully. Be true in all that you teach. And sadly, what we see in our society, the religious world today, is that the majority of the time that gospel of Jesus Christ is perverted. It's changed. It's altered. They take away from it. They add to it. And then once you get into, that's just to become a Christian, once you get into living the Christian life, our worship of the, the church, the organization of it, the worship of it, the 
work of it. And all of these aspects of the church, we see perversions of that gospel. That which we must remain in, in order to be saved. There's a qualification in, Rome, in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul talks about the fact that he had preached the gospel unto them. And he says in verse 2, By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. You must keep that message, that gospel of Jesus Christ, faithful in every aspect. Don't change it. Don't alter it. Preach the gospel, but preach the truth. Those two are synonymous. Don't change it. When you change it, when you add to it, take away from, substitute anything for it, then it is a perverted gospel and not the truth. And that perverted gospel will save no one. Thus, Preach the gospel without alteration, without change. But also, not only in our teaching, but we must live the gospel as well. Remember as we were talking about Jesus, and Him being a faithful witness, we spoke about, yes, the aspect of His speaking, that His words did not originate with Himself, but they came from the Father. And thus He was being a faithful witness in what He spoke. But many of the passages that we looked at were dealing with His life. That His life was setting forth the very nature of God. So that we look at Him, we see the Father. Well, we likewise must be faithful while we're not that witness, as Jesus was, as the apostles are, yet we are to live in such a way that when people see us, they see Christ in us. As Paul would say in Philippians 1, verse 21, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Well, Christ living in us. Jesus would state in Matthew 5, verses 13 through verse 16, The year is salt of the earth, but if the salt is, have lost its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What is it? You properly, you truthfully represent the gospel of Jesus Christ by the life that you live. So that when people see you, they see a, an influence, salt of the earth. That we are an influence in that world. And influencing it for a right, for just, for being God. The light of the world. That we are like that city that's set on the hill. People see us and our good works. What are those good works? Those are works that God hath ordained. The very, the very background of good is literally God ordained. That which God has authorized. And so as they see us, they're seeing within us a life that is God-ordained, that God has authorized, that everything that we do is thus glorifying God. And what happens? Because they see Christ living in us. They see us as that faithful representative of representing God here upon this earth. Not as an official ambassador of Christ, that's the apostles again. Not as a witness, but faithfully living the gospel of Jesus Christ, they are led to obey God. In Philippians 2 and verse 15, Paul would say, "...that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world." Many times we should ask the question, though, is the life that I am living, 
is the life that people see, a life that is harmless, that's a son of God, that's without rebuke? Do they see a light shining in the world that represents God within our life? That's what it should be that they see, but many times what do they see? In Titus 2 and verse 10, Paul would say, Not poor learning, but showing all good fidelity they, that they may adorn the doctrine of, our, of God our Savior in all things. The word poor learning, New King James has pilfering. It means to embezzle or to keep back something that belongs to another. I like that idea, actually, the way in which that's expressed. That didn't originate with me. I took it from someone else who probably took it from somebody else. But it's holding back, keeping back something that belongs to another. What belongs to others? The gospel of Jesus Christ. The doctrine of God. By our life, are we holding back that gospel, that doctrine of God? Or are we properly adorning it? Are we showing good fidelity, that's faithfulness, in the way in which we live? If we live improperly, then we're holding back something that belongs to them. We are embezzling the gospel, the doctrine of God. What a powerful statement that Paul makes to Timothy here. By your life, you can hold back, you can embezzle, you can steal the gospel from others. Or by your good life, you can adorn that gospel. So that when others see you, they see Christ living in you. And they're led to obedience to God. Are you properly representing God in His Word? Are you doing it by what you say, by what you teach? In your speech with others, do you represent God? Represent the Word of God? The Gospel of Jesus Christ? As you live your life, and people see the way that you live, do they see something that adorns the gospel of Jesus Christ, or are you actually embezzling the, that doctrine of God by your life? If you're holding back, if you're not properly representing God, you need to make the proper correction within your life. If you're not a Christian, you need to become a Christian. You cannot properly represent the gospel, the doctrine of Christ, without first obeying that gospel of Jesus Christ yourself to become a Christian. Through your faith, repenting of your sins, making a confession of your faith, and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. But then, as a Christian, living that type of life that God wants you to live, adorning the gospel, the doctrine of God, and if you have failed in that within your life, and repent of your sins, let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them, so that you can once again adorn the doctrine of God, and thus have that eternal home awaiting us, because that faithful witness, Jesus Christ, and that hope that we have, that God who will not lie has promised us, if we will but remain faithful to Him. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.